Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so I guess, so I guess just a quick note before I really dive into things. Um, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, and I would ask that if you put them in the chat, uh, could we maybe have someone kind of monitoring the chat? Because it will be easier for them who is not currently giving a talk to actually see the questions and such. Yeah, Halloon and I got you. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm uh, Ryan Muther, and I'm currently down at Northeastern. And I'm going to present uh, some of the work I've been doing on using language models as re-rankers to solve the problem of source attribution. So generally, how this is going to work is I'm going to kind of talk about what this problem of source attribution is and talk about the data sets and the tasks that we're using to explore it and then the forms of models that we are working with and then i'm going to give some information on the experiments i've done and on the results <clears throat> so this problem of source attribution is fairly straightforward to describe we have a text and we want to figure out you know what are the sources that the author used to write it and there are kind of similar problems in NLP, like uh, citation recommendation. There's a lot of work that uses bibliometric information to try and suggest papers to uh, uh, that might be useful for a writer to actually use in what they're writing. And then you have kind of more exactly uh, the problem of literary evidence retrieval, where they actually try and go to say, they say, you know, here is a claim. There is some evidence somewhere in this text that supports it. Can we go find it? Uh, but I think a lot of these prior approaches make assumptions about the structure and form of citation and the relationship between source and target that limits the applicability of uh, these approaches to kind of broader domains and to a wider set of problems. So what I want to do is see, you know, can we relax some of those assumptions and learn anything both about what kinds of problems these are actually more useful for if you broaden the definition a little, and what can these models actually learn? Uh, so to think about this problem, kind of broad strokes. There are sort of two forms of information if you're looking at a text that we can think about, which is the kind of explicit information from citations, where the author will explicitly tell you, here is the source I am using, and here's how you can go find it. And then you have text reuse, uh, which is where the author, either with or without attribution, has gone and taken some material from somewhere else and you can go hey hang on a minute this text here looks a lot like this text here maybe there's a relationship uh, so how do we kind of build a model that tries to mirror how a reader might use this information and this helpfully uh, is quite handily a sort of a one-to-one -one mapping to one of the forms of model we work with um, so before I kind of jump into things a little bit more deeply, just some quick terminology. When I talk about the target, that's the text we're trying to find sources for. And the source is the text or texts that the target makes use of. Uh, so for our data sets here, we are going to work with two data sets. And the first is a collection of Wikipedia uh, links between pages of Wikipedia to other pages of Wikipedia. Uh, as a kind of simplified form of the task. And then we're kind of going to jump to the opposite end of the complexity spectrum and work with some texts by the 15th century Egyptian historian Al Makrizi and some of the sources that he works with. And these in particular, I'm looking at because they kind of represent very opposite poles on sort of the sliding scale of how complicated the relationship between the target and the source is. Whereas with Wikipedia, we're looking for, you know, links whose text is exactly the header word, the head word of the cited page. So it's very structured, it's very regimented. And then with McCreasy, the relationships between sources and targets is a lot more fluid. 
uh, citations don't look like how a modern reader would interpret citations. Uh, a lot of times he just says the name of the author or the name of the work and the notion of a page number doesn't really exist. Uh, <clears throat> and then a lot of the times he just does not do any attribution at all. It's not uncommon for him to just dive into someone else's work and without knowing oh, here are the things that I know he's reading, it's difficult to say where that might be coming from. <clears throat> so the task here for Wikipedia is that we have taken all of the possible source pages and cut them up into their component sections. And the goal is that given the citing sentence with the link that you're trying to find somehow marked, uh, and maybe some context, some additional sentences on either side from the same section, uh, can we retrieve a section, not necessarily the first section, uh, but any section at all, of the correct cited page? And then uh, we've constructed this automatically by essentially scraping, taking a dump of Wikipedia, and taking links out of that automatically. And then for McCreasy, since the texts we're working with are quite long, uh, we cut all of the texts up into 300 token chunks. And the idea is that you're given a target, which is a piece of McCreasy, a 300 word chunk, and a mask, a uh, marked target span within it. So it's telling us, you know, here's the portion of the text we want to try and attribute. Uh, and the goal is to retrieve one of the possibly several uh, potential source chunks as annotated by a domain expert who is literally in the process of writing the book on this guy. And he bases his judgments on uh, essentially a, an alignment, a, a text reuse detection uh, algorithm that David Smith and I have worked on uh, called PASIM, uh, aligning these two texts that we're working with uh, that I can give you the names of if you want, but it won't be tremendously useful here because we're not historians. So uh, the various models that we're working here, we're going to start out with kind of a basic embedding similarity, and then we will move to this kind of generative re-ranking model. This is the one that I think nicely mirrors how a reader would go and work with this information. And then finally, we have your generation guided retrieval, which is very similar to RAG. Essentially, it's a it's a reformulation of RAG uh, because rather than caring about training the generator because we're working on question answering, we actually care more about tuning the retrieval portion of the of the model. So this is essentially RAG. <clears throat> so first, the embedding similarity. We're just going to re-rank the document the potential source documents by their similarity to the target. And the intuition here is that sources with shared text will have similar embeddings. Uh, exactly how well this works, uh, you will see, uh, but it turns out that this intuition may not be as true as, as initially thought, especially when BERT isn't really tuned to perform this task from the beginning. Uh, and we have our generative re-ranking model, which we can say, OK, we have some correct target S and some observed portion of the, tar uh, sorry, a correct source S and some observed portion of the target T. And we want to see how do, uh, what is the likelihood of conditioned on that generating the masked portion, which is the portion we're trying to attribute. So it's the link or the piece of text of interest of McCreasy. Uh, generating that under a tuned <clears throat> uh, tuned BART model. And the intuition here is that sources that are useful for reconstructing the target will give a higher likelihood, especially once the model has been trained to try and understand uh, you know, the ways in which the source can be manipulated to give you the target. And then finally, uh, we could actually, no, sorry, uh, we could also train this in a semi supervised manner by saying, okay, instead of giving the model uh, the true annotated target S, what if we instead gave it the top ranking retrieved candidate S prime? Uh, 
And this has the advantage of lowering some human annotation requirements while also uh, potentially maintaining some improvement over the baseline retrieval model. And uh, the baseline retrieval model we're working with here is just uh, you know standard BM25 that I took from Pi Serini. And so for an example here for this kind of process of constructing the input documents for the generator. Here we have this little chunk of Wikipedia, one mile west of US Route 491, along with Fort Butte. And then we can say, OK, so the thing we're actually looking for is US Route 491. And then for our potential source, we have US Route 491. This, in this case, is the actual source document. Uh, it's the first, it's the beginning of the first sentence of the Wikipedia article on that highway. And then you concatenate uh, T observed and S to get the generator input. And then once you have that, then you are pretty much good to go. And then another example here with classical Arabic, here's some text from McCreasy, uh, the reader of Arabic. So possibly no one here. Uh, might be interested to know that there's actually a citation here. The first uh, two tokens here are Kala Musabihi. Musabihi says this large thing. And <clears throat> so we can do this same game of masking and going and getting the source and concatenating the two together to create the input. And then finally, we have this generation guided retrieval, which is essentially just a rag. Uh, where we have a query, which is going to be the observed. Yes, the query is essentially the, the no, sorry, it's the masked portion of the text, uh, which we are going to see, you know, how can we find a source unsupervisedly that is useful for creating the target. And essentially, there are two components to this where you say, you know, for each potential source, uh, what is the likelihood of retrieving that source for that query? And then conditioned on the observed, uh, conditioned on uh, the query and that selected source, what is the likelihood of actually generating the target? So then you take all of that and multiply it together. And in theory, that gives you this, or you add it together. And <clears throat> That gives you, in theory, a score that we can use to perform this re-ranking. And this is fully unsupervised. And as a result, it is highly computationally expensive to the point where what we're running is not full RAG because I don't work at Facebook and we don't have the computational resources to actually do it. Uh, our graphics cards are too small. So what we had to do uh, was that we had to kind of, we had to freeze the generator portion. And the only thing we're actually tuning is the retriever. Oh no, someone left. But, uh, so as we will see, it turns out that having a functioning generator is pretty important. Uh, and so <clears throat> one other thing here that's maybe worth talking a little bit about is that you sometimes need to do a little bit of work to make the source information, uh, the information about the sources kind of visible to the retrieval model when we're first going and getting candidate sources for re-ranking. Uh, because a lot of the time, for instance, uh, you know, if you have a book, the title and the author are not on every page. So what essentially we can do is add a bit of bibliographic information, which in this case is going to be for Wikipedia. We just add the headword of the article to each section of a page, and then we add the uh, title and the author of each potential source work to all of McCreasy's sources. Uh, <clears throat> and then we can evaluate any of these possible ranking models with uh, average uh, recall at K and MRR, fairly standard IR metrics. And we see that if we add this citation information to the sources, we get a lot of improvement in the re-ranking model. So for instance, this is for Wikipedia. No, this, sorry. Yes, this is for Wikipedia. Uh, and we see if we don't add any of the citation information, we don't add the head word, uh, you get a recall at 1500 of around 0.35, which like that's as best as you can do even after re-ranking. And at that point, why are you even bothering?
Uh, but when you do actually add that data, you go up to kind of well above 0.8. It's, it's low, low 90s. It's 0.91, I think. Uh, so here, most of the answers are here somewhere. It's just the job of the re-ranker to figure out what, like, what is the process that needs to be used to move these up to the top of the list. So as far as our experiments go, we're going to talk about kind of two separate things. We have our retrieval experiments, which is largely what I've been hinting at so far, where we're going to say, you know, how well can these models actually learn how to do this uh, source attribution via re-ranking? Uh, what forms of model are good at this? And how much performance do we lose if we try some semi-supervised methods? And then we're going to look at some generation experiments. And this is particularly focused on Wikipedia because it could be that, for instance, a lot of why it's good at generating link names is that it has perhaps memorized portions of Wikipedia. Because for instance, things like BART are probably trained on Wikipedia. So has it actually memorized the data or is it actually learning something from this pre-training process? So first off, we will look at uh, the retrieval experiments for Wikipedia. And here we have this baseline model, uh, which performs all right, not amazingly. Uh, you know, mid 60s, recall at 10, around 50 MRR, pretty average. Uh, if you move to BERT, which recall isn't tuned at all, BERT on its own really cannot do this. Uh, the representations of documents that it comes up with are just not informative enough. Uh, but then if we move to a generative approach, uh, we see that it actually is quite good at it, uh, almost as good as one can possibly do, but uh, not quite. But given that the, <clears throat> given that there are, you know, cases where the baseline retrieval models can't find anything in the top 1500, that makes sense. Uh, but then instead, if we kind of relax the requirement for full annotation, and instead we say, you know, instead of using the exact correct source, we will use the top retrieved source, uh, you actually keep most of the performance you gain, which seems pretty interesting that there's enough that the model can learn just from looking at this admittedly kind of meh retrieval model. Uh, like, it's definitely learning how to ignore uninformative sources. Uh, however, if we move to RAG, things are somewhat grim. Uh, as I noted, uh, we weren't actually able to run the totality of RAG. The generator isn't being tuned. And what I think we're seeing here is that being able to fine-tune the generator when you're working with these sorts of uh, large retrieval augmented generation models is pretty important. And now for McCreasy, we have a pretty similar story where we've got you know, a reasonably fine baseline model. The recall at 10 is quite good, but there's probably uh, a lot more kind of base similarity between a source and its target because there is a fair amount of direct reuse in this data set, but there's enough for a you know query likelihood term frequency based model like BM25 to pick up on. Uh, and then BERT, as we see with Wikipedia, kind of similar drop in performance. And then the uh, fully generative model uh, also seems to perform quite well. Uh, you get a very large increase in MRR and a very slight increase in recall at 10. Uh, but with these results, it's worth bearing in mind that our test set is quite small. It's only like 19 documents, so it's maybe a little difficult to draw conclusions from, but we were going we are going to try so anyways. And then we can also play this same game of using a semi-supervised approach to training BART. Uh, and we can see that we still keep a lot of that performance, even if we are effectively ignoring human annotation entirely and just going back to the base like the data off of which uh, the annotator based their annotations and just using that, uh, we keep a lot of the improvement over the baseline model. 
And then we also see, similarly to Wikipedia, being able to tune RAG's generator is quite important. <clears throat> Sorry, one moment. A lot of talking. And <clears throat> now we will move on to the generation experiments, which we're kind of using as a diagnostic to see what uh, Wikipedia, uh, how much of this performance and this ability to solve this task comes down to a language model's ability to perhaps uh, complete Wikipedia articles, because it's possible that you know, BART in its token masking pre-training was given pieces of these articles and asked to complete them. Uh, so it could be that a lot of the ability of BART to do this comes from essentially. Sorry, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? I think, yes, yes. I think no, my we... headset briefly turned off. Um, Okay. I don't know why. Thank you. Uh, yes. So, <clears throat> yes, trying to figure out how well uh, Wikipedia can do this due essentially to data leakage, or are we actually teaching it things with this process? And baseline, without any fine tuning, uh, it actually is completely incapable of, of automatically filling in uh, the link text, which is honestly surprising. It indicates that Bart really has not memorized Wikipedia at all. Uh, and then in turn, if you just give it the target, you just give it the section you want to complete, and it says, you know, please fill in this link, uh, you get ac you get about 17% accuracy, which is fine. Uh, but more interestingly, what we see when we actually give it the source data is that its ability to do this goes up massively up into the 70% range. <clears throat> and what this is telling us is that, yes, the, the generator is actually learning how to manipulate the source to create the target. And we are actually getting, getting improvement from these experiments, from this training we're doing. And that lets us trust the results from two slides ago significantly more. <clears throat> So some kind of future work here is kind of going and looking at some additional domains. Like it would be interesting to look at Wikipedia's citations to others, to other places, for instance, the Internet Archive. I'm currently working on this actually. Uh, or looking at scientific papers like through Crossref, uh, which I'm also currently working on. And then looking at some cross-lingual settings, for instance, something like uh, I don't know, the works of J.S. Mill and his sources in, I believe, mostly French and German in addition to English. Uh, it would be interesting to see, you know, can we use, can we leverage the kind of multilinguality of these large language models to perform this task across languages? And it would perhaps be interesting to look at some alternative unsupervised methods, for instance, actually trying and tuning BART to some degree, or maybe someone with more computational resources can actually see how this works if you actually run a full RAG model on it. And I guess that leaves me with, you know, do any of you have any questions? And I suppose if you'd like to know more, uh, I'm going to be defending my thesis soon. And uh, a kind of expanded version of this work is a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. 